and I'm a public school teacher in Baltimore. Um, I, I teach high school, so I work with a lot of teenagers, and in Baltimore, a lot of teenagers have kids, so I work with uh, both like unintentional parenting and also, or like unintended parenting, I'm not gonna say it's entirely unintentional, um, and also the, the, the really concrete fact that if you live in a world that completely disrespects who you are, that the, one of the things that you can do to give your life real human concrete meaning is to become a parent and feel that like love and bond that comes from that. And it's, it's detrimental to you and your family and your children if you do it when you're not prepared to do it. But I really, really understand why it seems like it's such an attractive option. Um, so I'm interested in the, the politics of, of like talking with young people in a healthy way about the decision to start a family and what that can mean and I don't really like shoulds, but like what it can mean and um, maybe could mean. And I'm also really, really excited about having kids at some time and I'm also polyamorous and like well, I'm interested in talking about how uh, have, like different family structures that are not coercive or like obviously everything's coercive, minimally coercive and not patriarchal or minimally patriarchal and um, yeah. That's great. I'm glad I stuff I want to talk about. I'm holding a camera. <laughs> I'm interested too. <laughs> yeah, me three. That's fine. Uh, my name is Lester Smith. I'm a parent of multitudes. I have mm -hmm. five children. And um, I'm interested in talking about, yeah, it's it, ways to embed uh, the, the, what, are the, what are the limits of democracy within families. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's something we were talking about a lot. Yeah. That's great. I'm James, I'm here from Florida. I don't have any kids, but I'd like some someday. Um, I have done some childcare work. Uh, I did some tutoring of reading in uh, like K and pre-first for a while. And for a while I was seeing someone whose mom ran a daycare and I have lots of cousins, so I've done my share fare of diaper changing and all that good stuff, so. Um, my name is Donna. Leah, I also teach in Baltimore, and I'm also very interested in this idea of uh, democracy in the family. Um, I think if we don't have democracy in the family, how can we have it in a larger society? Yeah. And also the, the kind of activism that goes into making the choice to either reproduce gender roles mm -hmm. as well as other social roles, or make the choice not to reproduce those roles. And especially the activism involved in having kids who are uh, gender non-conforming, mm -hmm. and you become uh, advocates for them, and I'm just interested in, you know, as you advocate for them, what do you then encounter? Mm -hmm. So the gender piece is also really interesting. That's great. Um, so my name is Michael, like I said. Um, uh, Jenny, myself, and Emery live in Washington and in D.C. Um, I've lived there for about 10 years, so I'm uh, from Philly. And we both, um, well, we, we'll let Jenny here introduce herself, but so we're both teachers as well. We both teach at university um, in different subjects. Um, and for right now, we're spending a lot of our time 
with with Emery. Luckily, she was born at a time that fits our like the academic schedule. So we have like you know we, we like we finished in May and she was born in the end of uh, March. Um, so we have like the next few months to kind of hang out and, and become like parents and figure out what to do. Um, so like yeah, we also want to not suck at it. Um, and 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 we're lucky that we have models. My sister has five kids. Um, I've learned a lot from her. She's a few years older than me. Um, uh, and Jenny. Jenny's family is giving us a lot of help. Um, so yeah, we're, we're exploring how to, how to do that. And th I guess the first thing that we really should have said in the beginning is like, we're by no means like experts at this. We kind of create this as a space people to talk, not for us to like teach you how to be a parent, because I'm evidenced by the fact that she's pre-verbal. We're like not really a <laughs> point to introduce you guys to how to be a parent. But you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Jenny, and Michael kind of gave you a little bit of info about us, but so I always knew I wanted to have kids. I just didn't really actually see the reality of who I would feel comfortable with reproducing with, mm -hmm. and the way that I would feel comfortable bring who I would feel comfortable creating an environment to bring a baby in. So, um, yeah. And so, mm -hmm. from you know choosing to get pregnant to actually like making a birth plan and parenting, everything was really intentional for us, and that was kind of the best part of preparing for the baby. And so a lot of this process has just been, if nothing else, us trying to figure out that everything is a decision. And that even if it's not the right decision and we decide that or find that out later, at least it's something that we thought through and we try to think through. And um, yeah, so, and, and I taught young kids too. So I've always had a relationship with kids that, that weren't my own in that sense. like teaching young children. I've been providing childcare since I was 10. I'm the oldest of four, and I have a huge family, so. And I'd never really been around kids until a few years ago when my sister started having kids, so. That makes the, like, people feel better or worse. I, <laughs> I never really touched or held a kid until about four years ago. Um, yeah. Do you want to start with what you had written down? Yeah, you took the pet, didn't you? No, it's <laughs> not. So. Oh, oh, sorry. No, you want to just introduce yourself? Like, you know, what brings you to this specific space? Oh, hi, I'm Libby. Um, I'm just here because I just think like parenting is politics. Like you don't really think about like parenting as a place that really, like there's political like aspects, but there really are. So that's why I'm here. I want to learn about it. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> yeah, um, and that's kind of why we designed the workshop. Uh, you know, I'm the oldest, so I feel like as I went through the process of prenatal care, finding a midwife, finding a doula, my siblings were kind of like, why the hell are you thinking so hard about like every little detail? I'm like, well, that's the point. And so one of the things that we did, like the day we found out that I was pregnant, Michael started a blog for us. <laughs> and if nothing else, it became this way to kind of, you know, she'll have something to hold on to, to see what we were thinking. The community has a resource, and then also I'm held accountable to the decisions and the processes that we make as parents. And so that was one of our first things that we did to kind of at least create a space where I could write things down, maybe that I was thinking and insecure to share, or that Michael was thinking or insecure to share, community pressures. Um, and we didn't tell people about it, we just wrote it for it. Yeah, we kept it private. So we it, it became a repository that only he and I could view. And with the intention of making it more public later on, but initially giving us a space where the two of us could work things out. And the main thing was that you know we were doing what was societally expected. We were cisgender, male, female, reproducing, creating a life. Um, and how do you do that in a space where you try to create a politic that is challenging all of those expectations? And so here's your political and emotional life, and then you go and do what everybody kind of says, well, in the end, you're just going to do blank. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're negotiating that, and we're negotiating it all the time. And we wanted to at least make decisions in parenting that show that you can follow that so-called expectation, but do it in a way that, that queers those, or that challenges them and pushes them and further. Um, so we're both vegan, and a big part of the prenatal care was challenging others who assumed that we were somehow depriving this fetus of nourishment and depriving me of nourishment, which was like, of course, obviously bullshit. And anyone that's familiar with veganism is aware that it's much more than just a, a dietary choice, that for us this is like a foundational belief of how we organize our home and our lives, and that it wasn't just about buying crappy soy GMO mm -hmm. products, but instead we, we try to have a plant-based lifestyle. Um, so I have things, I have resources about that, you know, green smoothies that I did. I don't know if that's as interesting as 
far as like political decisions. Um, you know, we found a midwifery practice that met our needs, and for the first birth, we were more comfortable doing it with midwifery practice that had autonomy within a hospital, mm -hmm. as much as you can operating within a hospital. Um, we also found a doula who I met through a cloth diaper workshop. So she became our doula, and she also taught our, our Bradley Method childbirth class. And a big emphasis for us was that we wanted to do this where he and I were the center. We knew that we wanted to have family present during the birth, but that he and I wanted to kind of figure out the hu husband, they call husband guided childbirth, which is problematic on a lot of levels. But for us, it was just partner guided childbirth. Um, I'll skip some of this stuff because I think it's a bit more boring. Um, our labor, that was a political choice. We wanted to have it be a community endeavor rather than something isolated. I feel like the insurance and the hospital industrial complex kind of says labor is a private endeavor and in a way it's gross and painful and it should be hidden from society. And that wasn't our experience with it. And we wanted my mother, his sister, my sisters were present, our midwife, the doula. Your dad. My dad. Um, you know, it was, it was not seen as something that was a shut away, gross experience. Very empowering. Um, yeah, I have resources for that. That's and a lot of the stuff when we were drafting ideas, like again, what we thought people would come interested in, we have things on like, you know, what, like how do you negotiate, you know, more holistic health solutions with a hospital, you know? Right. Ideas for vegan nutrition. If people have questions and want to go that route, we're happy to talk about that, because again, you like absorb all this, trying to figure it out for yourselves. But our idea was that we kind of give an overview and then we can talk about what people are actually interested in. Yeah. Um, when people have questions about the mechanics of any of those things, like that's something that, whether you like it or not, like we have, <laughs> it's not, it wasn't fun to learn how to do that, but we, we know it all now. Well, one of our first kind of unpleasant experiences was when we went to, after we found out we were pregnant, we're like, we'll get a book. And it was like, let's find a book that, you know, can be kind of friendly to both of us. And we went to the bookstore and but found the, Mar the most, Noble in Georgetown. Mm -hmm. We found the most offensive mm -hmm. collection of like, a dude's guide to pregnancy. <laughs> Someone stole your wife and brought you a raging bitch. Like these extremely oh. offensive. But yeah, but I'm not, really? I, I shit you not, like really offensive books. And then, you know, women, the, well, I sucked and then I cried. It sucked something and then I cried. And it's like, that's not at all what our experiences we had hoped for or that we got. They were the completely like, positive and I'm sorry empowering. to give up your martinis, now you have to put that the one about. Oh, <laughs> sippy cups are not for Chardonnay, or Chardonnay is not for sippy cups. Like, <laughs> it's about this woman like, lamenting that she can no longer like, go out and like, get drunk. And the whole first, you know, <laughs> it, but I, you know, I may have critiques of that, but at the same time, you know, I, it, one mm -hmm. thing I've learned through the process is that childbirth and child rearing and pregnancy are your own. And the last thing I want to do is like, criticize or disempower another woman for the journey they took. Um, but that was not what we were looking for. <laughs> and so it took a while to kind of seek out, like he found Rad Dad, an actual book awesome. that compiles the zines, and we found other things that were good. So a lot of this was kind of DIY because there just weren't that many models out there for people trying to do it a little differently. Um, and so that's, that's what the initial inspiration for yeah. Just a question about the books, because uh, I know there's My Mother Wears Combat Boots. Yeah. yeah. You guys look at that we were just looking at well. that. I had bought that for my sister when she had her first kid, and she's like, you know, your average, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean, she was really receptive to the idea. So, like, I never really, I never read it prior to that, and I haven't read it since having a kid, but I suggest um, she really liked it. It was a like, good, good, like, you know, she's like, why is there this section about bringing kids to demo? She's like, I don't understand, like, why. You also like there's this disassociation <laughs> kind of lifestyle that maybe a lot of us are familiar with, but in that sense, it was she was a little put off. Except when you're in front of Sally May and the cops take out the big giant tank of tear gas. You're taking a lot like, of kids. Oh, I'm being pregnant. You're taking a lot of kids. I hope this is not being recorded, but the kids we ninety four, we take them sometimes to demos. <laughs> <laughs> kids are a great capital to have in demos. <laughs> they, work, <laughs> they challenge police violence in a different way. Um, as do pregnant women, mm -hmm. if you think sometimes it doesn't, it just doesn't. Um, but anyways, yeah, so part of it is the politics of birthing in a hospital, um, refu making sure that they're not going to slip your baby formula when you don't believe in mm -hmm. giving a child another species milk, um, when you're breastfeeding exclusively, mm -hmm. things like don't poke my baby and give her shit, she's just born. Um, and they want to give them vaccinations, and yeah. Yeah, I, I was there when my um, 
the, one of the students I mentor and have for years had her baby, and they like like really really messed this little girl up. They tried to induce her labor because her blood pressure was high and her she didn't dilate because she was in no way ready to have, give birth and then they scared her into a c-section during which she had a panic attack and they were like hope like kneeling on her chest and then two days later I had, I had told every single one of them these parents can make a decision about sugar when they get this child home I do not want you giving this child sugar in the hospital because it, once the kid gets sugar in their mouth, it changes their whole like brain reception of taste. And they kept like kept trying to put this sugary gel on the pacifier, just just the pat like. So yeah, that's like real. Yeah, it's an it's certainly an uphill battle, and certainly you have to really, especially in a hospital setting, you have to be really assertive. We were in a in an, like a. Like, like Chinese had a midwifery practice within GW Hospital in Washington. Um, and but after you deliver, you're in the... Right, and that's, so yeah, so the midwives are really open to birth plans and all these, you know, they know what a vegan is, you don't have to explain it. Like, you know, they have like a good base. But yeah, as soon as you go to postpartum, like mm -hmm. you're done, then you're in a normal hospital and they wanna, yeah, they wanna give her, oh, she's asleep, um, you know, you know, six, seven hours after she's born, they wanna give her hepatitis B injections, and they wanna give her a flu shot, they want to like, you know, do all these things. That they wanted to give us shots. Too. Yeah, they wanted to give us flu shots. Like, all these things that, like, you know, and they, it wasn't, do you want a flu shot? It was like, you're getting a flu shot, right? And so you have to be really assertive and, you know, know what you are know what you want beforehand, I guess, and be able to... You have to argue. not only be your own advocate, but in some cases, depending on the course of your labor, you have to have an advocate mm -hmm. present um, for a lot of reasons. Can we you talk can just more speak about that now, or do yeah. you want to talk more about no. it after? No, we, we can talk about whatever okay. people want. Yeah, um, so... Did you have an advocate in that in the post delivery stage? We had we had Michael. So I had a birth plan that I wrote up, and then I also created like a separate document for my family to have that kind of went through my own concerns and my wishes. That you know everyone says like you don't want to overload the hospital staff with your birth plan. Don't give them a six page birth plan. Give them a one page thing. So I'm like, well, I have more than one page worth of like <laughs> important things. And so what I did was I created a one-page thing for birth and a one-page thing for postpartum for the baby. And then the rest of it, Michael had a copy, and then our doula had a copy. And the idea was that if for any reason I was unable to voice these concerns, that other people were well aware of it. I didn't have it, like, you know, legally whatever. I kind of trusted the people that were. And I, and I figured there was a more personal accountability for that. Mm -hmm. um, but that came in handy. So one of the things that was important was everything the baby left, because we did in-room in room sleeping, mm -hmm. whatever it's called, bunking in room. Um, and so anytime she had to leave for tests, she was accompanied by either me or Michael. And that was also for the fact of formula and making sure that, you know, I've heard horror stories of women that are, you know, they bring in CPS and say, like, you're depriving your baby, you don't Child have enough. Um, you're not producing enough colostrum yet. The ba you know, so I just figured let her have somebody with her so that there's no chance of that happening. And then also because for them, you know, it's day in and day out. And this is not to demonize healthcare workers by mm -hmm. any means. My mother's a nurse for 30 years. My sister's a nurse. Um, but day in and day out, there's protocols of what they have to do. And anytime you decline something, you have to sign waivers of like, do you know that your baby could die because you signed this piece of paper? And it's like, yeah. And it's not a peaceful place for people to like <laughs> become a family. I mean, that's like an mm -hmm. understatement. But like in the process of like becoming a family and like you know bonding with the baby and breastfeeding for the first time and all those things, you have people who come in a hospital room twenty four hours a day, like every fifteen minutes. And they have a board that looks it's like <laughs> yeah. that. We love it all. That like they keep track yeah. of all the medications they give you, and so right after labor, they're like you know you have to take. They wanted to give me a laxative, a um, Motrin. And there was one other thing. Bunch of Tylenol for And I'm like, this is more than I had to like birth this baby. Like, I don't need any any of that. I'm all right. And uh, every every four hours they came in, it was the same routine. And so, you know, you're exhausted and your body is tired. So it's important to have somebody present that at least knows, yeah. like, she doesn't want to do that. Um, and that can be a partner. That could be. A, I mean, that is in some sense a function of the doula. You know, the, the mm -hmm. birth assistant. Absolutely. You know, so a doula can do that, a partner could do that. Certainly family members are good, but um, I, I would, I mean, doing it again, I would certainly be nervous if Jenny was there alone. Because you definitely need someone who's, 
you know, she was anesthetized and she was very clear-headed, but if you were anesthetized or you weren't clear-headed, then you would, I would suggest definitely having someone who strongly knows what you what you want and is okay yelling at hospital members. Yeah. Yeah, please. Oh, I have a question. And it's not, it's like back a couple it's of fine. topics, but um, I'm a vegan now and I'm, I would be worried, like I know you can get a lot of nutrition from mostly plant-based, except I, the only thing I'd be worried about is B12. And I read somewhere that like, and it wasn't funded by like Purdue Chicken or anything. So it was like a legit study, but it, like babies, well, if you don't get enough B12, um, the, the babies are born with like brain, some can be born with like brain damage. And I was like wondering how you get, you just get B12 from vitamins, like how I get it now, or? I personally eat a lot of Brewer's yeast and mm. dark leafy greens. Oh, okay. So those are like, our midwives were kind of like disinterested in prenatal vitamins and rather said eat mm -hmm. healthy food. And our midwives, created like this diet that they recommend for all patients and the only column on there which is like fucked up in my head but they're like eat eggs it's the most nourishing mm. thing and I'm like telling this a pregnant woman who <laughs> carrying a fertilized egg like I don't know it's something about it just seems weird um, <laughs> it's like saying it's you really want your food for yeah it's the perfect women. food but other than that everything else they recommended was vegan so they pushed the idea of lots of plant-based nutrition um, plant-based grain-based and then, you know, I supplement, I did have a prenatal vitamin, I have that one in omega-3 and 6 one, mm -hmm. but I took that just out of like being indoctrinated into a fear that I'm somehow not getting enough, but I would have taken it either way. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it never crossed my mind to, it no more crossed my mind to consume animal products while pregnant than it did to jump off a bridge. Like, to me, it was just, it's so foundational to who I am, and so, the nutrition party that I had down pat before I got pregnant. I figured it out, I had my root. Um, but and with the smoothies, that's a big add, that's a big addition. Yeah, I did add the smoothies. Um, a really good resource, and I don't want to take her steam yeah. because she's done this homework a lot, is um, Breeze Harper. And so on her Sister Vegan project, she's put together a lot of resources for, for holistic vegan nutrition. And one of them is the green smoothies. So just you blend together a bunch of frozen berries and whatever you like, but then you add to it spirulina, chlorella, um, soy lectin, and hemp protein. They're all, like they're all powders and they're all available. To, we bought them from Amazon, they're really cheap. They last yeah. a really long time. And I did those every day. And so that was kind of my easy go-to for my dark greens, um, for the, at least the algaes. And that was my way of kind of doing a little bit extra. It's good for brain development and things like that. But it, part, it folding into that a pediatrician was important for us to find. I, the last thing that we wanted, when you're dealing with a new baby, you already have enough pressures of like, am I doing it right? But the last thing you need is some lecture every time you go to the doctor that like, she's underweight by one ounce. It must be because you're vegan. <laughs> and like, mm -hmm. that I just didn't want to deal with that. I wanted a supportive environment. And we found a really great pediatrician in DC and just different like listers are really good for that. So. In that sense, um, my vegan health was never really called into question by the midwives. The first thing they say is, well, how are you getting B12? Because it is important for babies' yeah. development. But lots of women are pregnant and don't, that eat all kinds of animals and pay no mind to, to their intake of B12. And yeah. so, you know, I think that intentionality was an important part of it. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, what were you saying? Hey guys. Um, so we're neighbors. Yeah, <laughs> and, and friends. And so my question is, um, because I I know uh, Michael for a long time, and I know his politics and all that. So my question, and I always meant to ask that, <laughs> I just never did. So you guys know what you guys know. Uh, what got you actually? And correct me if I'm wrong. But what got you going to the hospital instead of just, because, you know, Christina and Tarek, they decided yeah. both babies are born at home, yeah, yeah. you know, and they use the water mm -hmm. method and something like that. Yeah. So what got you not doing that yeah. and decided to do, to go to the hospital? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a, that was a hard one for us. Like, right when we found out we were pregnant, we went to coffee and crumbs up the street and we, like, sat there with a notepad and we're like, midwives. <gasps> And um, the biggest thing was just, I had never given birth before, and in this 
scared way. I didn't know how my body would respond. I knew I wanted a midwife. I knew I wanted to go spontaneous. I knew I wanted an a unmedicated vaginal birth in the water. Um, but my mom's a nurse of 30 years, and it just came down to this, like, how can I negotiate doing what I want, birthing the way I want, but not birthing in a way that's, because my family doesn't live in DC, and so I wanted my mother to be in the room when I gave birth. She's an OB nurse for, like I said, 30 years, and just delivered hundreds of babies. And so part of it was that I wanted her to be a part of it. Oh. And so knowing that aspect meant I had to kind of clue her into my labor, and mm -hmm. I wanted to do it in a way that was respectful, yet also like autonomous for us. So letting us kind of navigate it the way we want to do it, but in a way that said to them, if for some reason my body doesn't respond that I want to, and you know, if it was a different city that like I could be at a hospital in 10 minutes if I needed to, or five minutes, I would just, I just guess I had been indoctrinated too much to the scare of like, how will your body respond? For the second labor, I we don't also, think that. We also heard a lot, just because her mom is an OB nurse, we, we received like, and in retrospect, you can, I can kind of see it more as pressure, but a lot of these like, let me tell you about this horror story. You know, <laughs> someone, you know, yeah. like, that's I fine. can see that. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of horror stories. And I, I can see I, that. In truth, like babies who are born in homes who, you know, come out with such and such issue, you know, some of them, some of them die, some of the women die. Like that, that certainly happens. I, I, you know, that being said, I don't think that home births are unsafe um, if, if you do them correctly. But we, we heard a lot of really scary things. And I think we looked at, at least in DC, again, that's what we know, DC has like two or three birthing centers, which are not hospitals, and then they have um, one or two midwifery practices. And we just went for the one that, the, the one that we did wisdom at GW is like, not only is it a midwifery practice, but it's an explicitly non-intervention midwifery practice. So they don't provide uh, epidurals, they don't provide, um, you know, they, they, they will do a C-section, of course, if you need, they don't do C-sections. Their C-section rate is 3%. Which is oh, the national yeah. section rate is ten percent, fifteen percent, really, really extremely high. Um, so, so that practice explicitly yeah. is not only is it a midwifery practice, but it's like a you know holistic health midwifery practice. So, so yeah. it seems like it was a very tricky uh, process for yeah. you guys, basically, for, especially for you to commit between you know what you've been told, what all the fears that I I can just. In, Imagine that you went through, you know, it's your first baby. Yeah, and I just didn't know. And like, the more we looked into the different um, elements of it, we were just kind of like, this is how we'll do it this time. And, you know, we do intend to have a big family if we're able to. And so, in that sense, I don't think that we necessarily would do the hospital route again. But as a hospital route, it really was like I could have birthed anywhere. I mean, my parents yeah. were in town and we labored for most of it at their hotel room. And I went to the hospital at six centimeters and she was born two hours later. So like, I probably could have done it anywhere, but <laughs> in the whole like nine month of post of pre prenatal care and before she was born, I don't know that I would have been okay with the like continual discussions of like the what if kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And now I know my body, of course. Functions. That's a really important part of it, is negotiating it with your partner and your family. and. I guarantee anyone, I mean, depending on anyone's families, but if you tell your family that you're doing it in your in your house with no one around, people are gonna. Well, we couldn't do it in our house because we have an apartment. We have a one bedroom apartment with an English master. Seventy dollars. Yeah. So, <laughs> would it necessarily be the best? Like, you know, they deserve to have their private, quiet space, and me laboring in front of them, and there, think, there's no room for the tub anyway. What I think is like, a, it, it makes me feel like really good, and actually, I'm proud of you guys because. You guys informed yourself beforehand, you know, like very well informed. Obviously, I, I keep hearing about all these like vitamins and shots and they want to give you and everything. I would be clueless to be honest with you at this point, yeah. you know. So it, it feels good for because not everybody is going to take that alternative that you know, just give birth at home, they are going to go to the hospital, right? And if that is your alternative, you know. Um, it's, it's so great that we have people that are actually so well informed about why you might want to consider before yeah. going to the hospital. So. And if people are like at, at the considering stage or, or at the whatever stage, look at local community spaces. Like, okay, we don't, we don't live in Baltimore, but we found a space in DC that's called Emergence Center, um, which is something very similar to this. But we went to a cloth diapering workshop there for free and then later took childbirth classes there. So, like, a lot of spaces that, like, normally, like, I mean, non children having people would use for like, 
you know, your Anarchist Black Cross meeting or like the yoga studio, like a lot of those also have resources for parents or to be parents. Uh, one and then two. Okay, so first just on that, the free school does have classes around certain things like that. Um, also, I just wanted to see if at some point we could shift to the like family structure and like democracy between parents and kids and between partners and stuff like yeah. that. So. Well, let's see, we have to say that we can shift a little bit. Okay, um, so I, I can help you shift. The first thing perfect. Perfect. It, you know, to be fair, there actually are a whole bunch of, when I, so my oldest just graduated from high school like last week, so that's how long I've been doing this. And I started when I was probably younger than you guys. Mm -hmm. So there are a whole set of books that actually aren't, you know, I didn't, I didn't run across any of those books. You know, the books we had was what to expect when expected, right? It just, a, but they have their own politics in there. So right. I would suggest there's actually, not like we don't all have a lot of other stuff to do, but I actually don't think there is kind of a, an anarchist or a radical guide. There's a radical guide to parenting. Mothers have written, um, in fact, I came across, I think one of the ways I encountered AK Press was through one of the books they produced. I forgot which one. Is that the one you talked about, the mother, my mother was combat this? Yeah, it, it was a, she was on that panel and then there was someone else too. There was, there were two people on that panel. Um, but there isn't a, kind of a guide, which was kind of a, 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 a working class or a class or kind of a leftist guide to all the resources you can need if you want to do some other thing. Right. So that's kind of, I'm just throwing that out there for someone that has an idea either. But now, as far as the, the limits of the democracy, um, the challenge is that kids physiologically cannot control themselves, cannot control their own impulses in a certain way, right? So it's like, okay, there is a way, you know, and then better than there is the, is the reality that different types of kids require or are moved by different methods of governing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember struck, but so the sister who presented at the, the mother. It, it, I don't th I think it was China. What she looked like? Really tall. Yes, white? Yeah. Black really kids? tall, red hair. Yeah, light skin kid, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So she, and she was talking about her process, yeah. right? She was talking about, and she was like, there was this moment where at first she was raising her, her, uh, her, her, her boy using anarchist principles, like treating the, treating the son as if he was an agent of his own, you know, he had full capacity, mm -hmm. right? And the natural conclusion of that, well, it's not quite natural, but the kid end up running her to the point where she's like, no, no, this isn't going to work anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then she used, she, she applied her technology. She used another form, right? She, she started to realize, like, listen, no, these kids can't fully govern themselves, so I'm going to have to devise something I, because I, consensus just doesn't work with a child. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's something that I mean. That's something that we talked about a lot. And, you know, like I said, we're very intentional. The idea is like you, yeah. you, you figure something out, you talk about it for two years, and at the end of a two-year conversation, you you know what you're going to do, and it will fail, and you'll do something different, and then I'll fail, do something different. And I think being open to that is like a, a good first step. Like being open to the fact that you're going to fail, and people are going to kind of put fun at you. Um, but what we try to do is to negotiate those things, like I said, beforehand communicate through them, to model them based on like larger principles as opposed to specific practices, right? It's like I assume like, oh, I want my child to, let's say, be vegan, for example. Um, that more so than like, how do you make a kid vegan? You know, how do you teach a kid compassion? How do you teach a kid, um, you know, issues of, of you know, taking care of, of pets, let's say, you know, of, of companion animals? Um, so I think like what we've tried to do, again, I mean, we haven't taught her really anything, um, but we do, we do, do you know, have some child care roles for older kids and, and nieces and nephews and cousins. And so that's been the challenge is you can't say to a kid, you know, what do you want to do today? Oh, you want to, like, you want to go swimming in December, like in the river? You're like, sure. That's not the <laughs> you know, kids, kids don't know what's best for them sometimes, yeah. and that's certainly yeah. true. Yeah. We're not all free thinking. But we are trying to, like, morph advice oh, from so others. So, like, yeah. her sleeping in the bed with us. And, like, a lot of other people are like, why are you doing that? That one day they're just gonna not get out of that bed, and it's like no, we're, we're choosing this intentional practice of of co-sleeping, of sleeping together. It's a family bed, and you know we're we're practicing baby wearing, and there's like decisions that we're making that 
to other people seem like you're gonna spoil the child and it's like okay let's go put her in a cold empty room mm -hmm. like swaddled in a crib and leave her in there to try to soothe and cry it out like no that's not our model it's not what we're trying to do um and the vegan thing is something that we're negotiating a lot right now and writing this piece about how the sexual politics of meat influenced me mm -hmm. and it came across me that like you know, my whole narrative is the fact that I wasn't vegan when I was born. I came to these decisions. I read Charlotte's Web. I then told my parents and had to, you know, combat this as a kid, being told, like, Skyline Chili, that's okay. And like, no, no, I think there's cow and beef and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, like, that's my narrative to veganism. And, you know, that I have a narrative to feminism. I have a narrative to different politics. And that she's kind of in this different boat where she's being lumped into them. And... Mm -hmm. At this point, we're making these decisions for her, but it's like, you know, I have a friend who has a daughter and she deals with these questions too. And, you know, one day she's opening up her kid's lunchbox and there's a carton of milk in it. She's like, you know, how do we talk about this? And if she's vegan, her daughter's vegan, and yet is not being vegan at the lunch table. And so they start this conversation and this little girl, you know, just like loses it, starts bawling. And she's like, I didn't want to tell you, but like everybody asks why I don't have this. And, you know, I just tried it, I just tried it. And you know, it's like creating spaces where, you know, our kids, it's no secret that mm -hmm. mommy and daddy are not keen on speciesism. Like, it's no secret that mommy and daddy are anarchists. Like, the politics <laughs> is not <laughs> hidden from her. But then at the same time, how is, she gonna, how is she gonna make that decision on her own or at least keep that decision alive? And so creating an environment that at least, like we're saying, like teaching her compassion teaching her the different values with them, mm -hmm. but letting them still be something that she believes in, rather than she's like, fucking parents are wackos, like, I'm mm -hmm. going out there, I'm eating steak, I'm like, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Like, we both kind of come to, we, we both had like this, this kind of similar revelation recently that, you know, a lot of our politics and like a lot of people's politics in this room are oppositional politics, you know, we're, we're you know, anti-speciesist, so we're vegan, you know, we're against patriarchal structures, so we call ourselves anti-sexist. Like, these are oppositional politics we develop, because we see things, we're like, well, that's kind of fucked up, so like, I'll be the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. um, my dad's a cheesesteak chef, or cook, cheesesteak cook. Um, you know, so like, doing that with him for 10 years, I was like, okay, this is kind of gross. I'm yeah. vegetarian now. Oh, now I'm vegan. Like, so, when your parents are the vegans, you know, do you breed weird Republican NRA kids? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's like, fear in the back of all of our heads. <laughs> Um, some of it was before, um, you know, he really could 
understand how to make decisions for himself, um, you know, I started talking to him about, you know, why we eat the way that we eat. Because he started to notice that other people eat other things and that when we were in certain spaces, it was like, you know, you can't eat that. Right. You know, we don't eat that, you know. Um, but, I, but I would talk to him about that. And then, and then later, I started to evolve, that, that's, that started to evolve into, well, you can eat that if you want. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna choose not to eat that, and we're not gonna make that in our house, right. you know. And, um, and there were times when, especially around, I, I come from a very, very large family, and, um, and I'm like the only vegetarian in my gigantic family. Um, I'm, I'm, I happen to be the oldest of uh, 24 grandchildren. And so, um, you know, this is really weird for everybody, but they, you know, they sort of embrace it too. And, um, but in funny ways, like, you can eat this, just take the meat out of it, you know? Like <laughs> 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 You know, it has lots of vegetables in it. Um, you know, and then, and then when, when I brought my child into the family, who was the very first um, great-grandchild, mm. you know, people, um, sort of question that, but then they also understood that this is this is the, the decision that I make. But they were still always like, "Come on, you you want this, don't you?" You know. And, and so anyway, so so that kind of thing happened, and and we allowed him to do that. And one day when he was about five or six years old, um, having had like his first chicken nugget <laughs> from one of his cousins, you know, he was like, "Oh my God, that's so good!" <laughs> and you know, he was wanting to eat them. And, um, and he was like, so what is this again? And I said, it's a chicken. And he was like, oh, I don't want to eat chicken. Right. You know? and, and he made the decision for himself that that's just not right. what he's going to do, even though it was delicious and he loved it. You and know? that's one of the things we're hoping, at least in, in terms of that, is that if, it, if our diet, our lifestyle is normalized at the pre-verbal stage, that by the time they're like putting thoughts together and they're able to say, like, what is that? And you're like, oh, that's, like, that's Betsy the cow. Right. Like, it's not like the thing I've always been eating. And like, you know, at the yeah. age when a kid can go like cow, moo, like right. at that age it's much more difficult for them to be like, oh, that's yeah. that? No. But you're, but you're also involving them in your own decision making yeah. process. Like, I made this decision because right. of this. You right. know? And you may or may not want to follow along with that yeah. decision. Mm -hmm. So there's that. But then there are other ways in which, you know, I thought I was making these decisions based on my personal politics and he started to veer away from it. And then he actually helped to inform my my own politics in a different way. He steered me in a different direction. And the way, and the way that uh, one of the ways that that happened was through um, what I started out with as a belief in pacifism, you know, nonviolence, you know, all of that. And so we had a household that didn't have a television, um, no, that had no war toys in our house, and you know, all of that. And he was a boy, and I was, you know, having to always defend that. Um, that decision, um, and you know, and for a long time, it was fine. But then there's a point where you know he goes to school and he right. makes friends with people who like have guns in their houses when they he goes over for play dates and you know that sort of thing. And he started to embrace it. And the thing that happened for him with that was that um, you know, and he was a kid that came to um, to all of the you know rallies and marches and, you know, organizing that I was doing um, from the time before he was born, you know, so, so he was showing up to those things. So he knew my politics, he, you know, he knew our politics as a family, um, and he still veered toward, um, like, wanting to play with guns all the time, and it eventually, like, when he was six and seven years old, really gravitating toward war history, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then beyond that, too, like, the mechanics of you know weaponized um, war memory, you know, and um, so he can tell you everything about like how particular guns work and how many you know rounds it can fire off in a, in, in certain amounts of time and stuff. And you know, there's a part of me that's like, oh my god, that's horrifying. But then at the same time, like I don't want him to you know cling to this more by yes. you know wanting to rebel against me yeah. and, and cling to it more by you know pushing it too hard so i had to let it go and just be like okay that's what you're interested in and um <laughs> so one of the things he was telling me recently is that um he had found out about the the sea shepherds mm -hmm. you know and he was like well you know and this is a conversation we had two weeks ago and he's almost 14 now you know he said you know how you know you don't like this whole thing with me and weapons and you know and and everything that i know about like 
how to blow shit up. Um, <laughs> I was just like, yeah, he was like, well, you know, somebody was telling me about the Sea Shepherds the other day, and I watched this documentary, and I think, you know, like, I, I'd like to be able to sabotage things that like, cause destruction to things in this world. <laughs> That's what you can do with this, and that's, and that's, yeah. <laughs> and that's actually not a problem with that. You know? Yeah, that's kind of great. That's and, a great and so I've yeah. been moving now toward this idea that you know it's they like, find their own path, right? And you know, and 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 you know, and, I, and I've been and I've been grappling with the idea of nonviolence and you know what it really means and you know what violence really is and you know and, and the power dynamic of violence and that sort of thing. And he's been helping me with that just through this one thing. Anyway, so there, that, I'm sorry, I took up a lot of space with that, but I just wanted to share that with you all about you know decision making with. I think that's great, and I think that, like I said, the point you make is amazing that we find our own path. You know, you yeah. teach kids a set of ethics, and like I said, we teach them a set of ethics, and we hope that they get to an end point that like we share that we don't. You know, you love your kids, and you know, if they're a, a weirdo, you know, like you know, okay. they, you disagree with everything, you love your kids, right. um, but you hope that they kind of find the same path. Or, or the same destination, at least. Right. But like everything is choice, and that's the one thing that like I find myself constantly reiterating to people when they say, "But you're gonna choose veganism for her." I mean, you choose to feed your child this, so mm -hmm. you're making ideological choices for your child. Right. And like because somebody does not have guns, that's somehow seen as a choice. But to proliferate their life with right. these video games and toys and representations of violence, that's not a choice. That's just you know, everybody. Right. And so the benign nature of, you know, popularized and hegemonic choices is so erased. And that, like, the only people that are being accused of making choices for their child and limiting their, their ability to make their own decisions are those making ones that challenge the status. Mm -hmm. And right. so that's what's so interesting to me. And I'm sure that we'll deal with it for a lot longer. But even the nine months of pregnancy, everything I did, it's like, but you're choosing to do this, you know, what if you're depriving her? I'm like, but do you go challenge people that choose to eat, you know, a hamburger? McDonald's? Like, they want to have McDonald's through their pregnancy yeah. versus somebody who wants to have, I don't know, something else that's not a hamburger. And it's like the accepted modes of decision making and the less threatening ones. I think it's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, well, on that, I think it's not so, so choice is often used, but I think, um, being thoughtful and intentional mm -hmm. is something that is maybe not done as often, or at least I was not raised very thoughtfully and intentionally. Sorry, mom and dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's something I think about too. I mean, I I think about behavioral choices. Things like, I remember being a little kid, um, <laughs> there was a girl in preschool who used to bite me, apparently. <laughs> and I would just let this happen and be like, what is she doing? And <laughs> I was very much, it was like three, and I was very much raised um, after that, maybe even before that, told like someone hits you, you hit them back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I don't think I ever did that, really, but that's what I was told. and so interested in, in how you all deal with these things, but also how you talk about them, or if you do, before you have a child, because um, it makes sense that you focused on, you know, prenatal care and everything, but do you have, did you have a lot of, like, intentional conversations about what happens if our daughter has a boyfriend and she's only 12, and, I, you know, I don't yeah. know, those, all those things. We've had some of those conversations, I mean, I think, and, and I think, Inevitably, you have a lot of those conversations, and I think, like, without going into biographies, like Jenny and I were raised extremely differently and had extremely different um, life experiences. And I think that being said, we had a lot of conversations about, like, you know, how I dealt with bullying, how she dealt with bullying, how you know. So, like, you talk through those. In, in no way do we find solutions or, or or anywhere near answers. But I think we kind of both know, like, where we're both coming from in a sense. You know, like what what we're more sensitive to, definitely. And then from there, you know, now, did you have, yeah? Um, I believe in self-defense. Um, so there, there actually is two related questions. One is, actually, one is how you discipline a kid, 
because um, that's one form of violence, how you actually discipline the kid. And then how you deal with violence, how you have kids deal with violence visited upon them. Mm -hmm. So um, this is where, you know, where in hindsight, we had conversations, but what we had to do is allow the kids to reveal themselves. Mm -hmm. So with the violence thing, um, we have, with five kids, we got a range. Some of our kids, our, our, we believe that kids should, we, no, what we did, we taught them a rule. So first you go to, first you tell them no, right? You, uh, you tell them no, you tell them no twice, then you, if it's a teacher or an adult that you care about, you tell them, if those three things don't work, then you take care of it. And you make sure you take care of it in a way that they will never do that again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right? Because what you have to allow for is you have to allow for both. Yeah. Right? You have to allow for a peaceful, you have to give them the capacity to make a peaceful decision. And you have to give them the capacity to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And then, and then you embed in that the, the idea that you will never be the aggressor. We don't want you starting things. Mm -hmm. We will let you finish them, but we don't want you starting them. That's it. And I think setting kids up, like, I think one of the conversations we've had, I know we have to, get, have to finish up in a second, but one of the conversations we've had a lot is, like, not setting a kid up to fail. Like, not setting a kid up so that they're the weird, vegan, freak, pacifist kid that, like, everyone makes fun of, and they have more bullies, and everyone offers chicken nuggets. You know, like, you know, like, how do you set a kid to not fail? Like, no, not the one that blows shit up. We're all scared. We love you, but... Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. But yeah, so that's one of the things. Like, like, how do you not set your kid up for failure? Like, you know, how do you how do you teach your kid exactly? Violence is wrong. We don't attack things. But yeah, if someone like you know does such and such and such, like you don't then just get beaten up for, for ten years until you realize there's an alternative. So that, and that's something we we tried to try to figure out. Like, how do you not set kids up to be failures? How do you not set them up to be uh, socially isolated? How do you not set them up to? And, and there's solutions. I mean, there, there's, and there's different models, you know, there's different kinds of schooling, there's different kinds of, of parenting, there's different kinds of, of buddy systems with siblings. And I think that those are things that we're kind of excited to kind of get into. My, sorry, I had another piece yeah. to the question before I had forgotten. Did you, and, and feel free anyone to answer who has kids, um, did you talk about any of these things, like behavioral things, or before you decided that you were going to have a child together? And you mean like in terms of like in terms of parenting? Did you talk about any things that you strongly stand for in parenting before having children yeah. or before deciding to have a child? Together? Yeah. So yeah. A, a background too is Michael and I have been together for about a year and a half, and so yeah, we met relatively recently. When we met, it was like we knew that we wanted to be together, but then we also knew that we wanted to have kids, and so we had a lot of intentional conversations about you know how we would manage a life together and how we would bring other people into the world together as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, both of us have had longer relationships and not had children with people. Mm -hmm. And this was much more of a, you know, we both were on the same page about how we want to have children and that we'd want to do it with each other. Literally. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of yeah, doing it, can I bring up my point? Um, so I'm actually like I'm really interested in sexual politics and like how we raise people to feel good in their bodies and feel good about saying no and also saying yes to the things that they want to say yes to. And um, in doing some research about how to raise sexually healthy kids, um, it's like I think we all kind of know this that if you raise kids and you constantly tell them that like sex is dirty and it will result in all of these horrible consequences, they're probably gonna like have sex like right then. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> and that the actually like the statistically the teenagers the it's got to be a pretty small portion of the population, but the teenagers with the absolute most like least teen pregnancies, least STDs, most healthy relationships are the children, or actually, 
not necessarily most healthy relationships, most like staving off sex for like really long periods of time are the children of sex ed teachers. Because like you talk about it all the time, it becomes this thing that like mom and dad talk about, so it's like not that sexy anymore. <laughs> and I'm thinking about it partially in relation to sex, but also partially in relation to the veganism, because yeah. that's another kind of moral issue. Right. That if it's like animal eating animals is like this filthy thing that some heathens do, then like the kids are probably gonna wanna. Whereas if it's like it's his choices. Let's talk about food all the time. Let's talk about animals and like it'll be like I get it. Okay, I didn't. I want to eat vegetables. Vegetables are awesome. <laughs> Shut up about it already. Like, yeah, um, and that's what we've been trying is like positive, not negative. Like, yeah. Why veggies are good, not why cows are bad. Right. Generally. Yeah. <laughs> a related point. For years, I tried to teach my daughter to swim. Very successful with my son. He was older. Uh, personally, I was just thrown in the water. And then recuperated a few times before I learned to swim. But she, for two years, I worked with her and it really never made any real good progress. Uh, it got a little past blowing bubbles in water. In five minutes, a 15 year old girl at a pool had her doing dog paddle and a, a little swim. It was, there's some things you're so close to them and there's such a relationship that you can't do that someone else can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it, and it's a different, uh, you think of it from their point of view, the child's point of view, it's, they look at you differently. They're not trying to so much emulate you or, they, they look up to you in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that's related to what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, there's just certain things that, and it's gonna surprise you, it's gonna, I mean, it was great to see her swim. I loved it. I was both crying and, yes. and laughing at the same time. It was, it, it was bittersweet, but um, you get to see it. It's going to happen. That's great. We're going to want to close because I, I see organizers give me dirty looks. Um, but we, want, we want to thank people. This is the first time we've done this. We've, well, we just had the kid, but we like, <laughs> well, we like had this idea and we're like, okay, we'll do this. Maybe people think we're weird, but we'll do it anyway. Done. Um, but the, the, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> we have um, the blog that we mentioned we have, we're not like looking to recruit readership, but if people want, yeah, check um, it out. we started it before and it has like the longer explanation of like how to use cloth diapers, how to build like your own mobile, like stuff that we figured out along the way and like posted there. Um, it's thoughts of a pregnant vegan dot wordpress dot com. I imagine if you Google how to pregnant vegan you can find it. So, um, yeah, we but, talk about like the issues that we had with, that like each of us had different elements of all of it. And but yeah, so creating have, a space for the baby within the tiny apartment. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Like having shit for her, but being anti-consumerist was a big mm -hmm. issue. Uh, you know, how do you supply yourselves for the baby without buying into the idea that they need to have a ton of stuff? Um, Nike boots. So yeah, we have a lot of that there. And if people want to like correspond to that, people can contact us. Can people email us for that? What? Thoughts of pregnant vegan? You can comment on it. Yeah, so and people want to get in contact with us so we can give you our email address and people have questions, but like the nutritional information is on there, a lot of like logistic nuts and bolts kind of things are on there. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you guys.